Welcome to the Murder in 20 podcast, where I, Bobby Stevens, am your host with a new episode every Wednesday. If you're a serious fan of true crime and love listening to podcasts but don't want all that small talk, you've come to the right place. We get right to the facts. Murder in 20 episodes are concise and complete in 20 minutes. Less talk and more true crime. Every episode is free on our website at murderin20.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and YouTube. Also learn about upcoming episodes on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. To support Murder in 20, feel free to leave a five-star review on any one of them, or all of them. We're not shy. And we couldn't do this podcast without all our sources, which we acknowledge throughout the podcast and are listed on our website. Thanks for tuning in. Now let's get to this week's episode. With tight spirals of blonde hair resting on her forehead, a smiling Sherry Miller posed for the camera. Born in the state of Michigan in 1971, she wasn't a natural beauty and used makeup to look her best to attract men. But it's the photos of her in court that tell the true story of Cherie. Her mouth pursed in defiance, the lips turned downward at the corners, and her eyes dark and angry. That is the true Cherie. As reported in the Las Vegas World News, Cherie was attracted to and excited by the seedier side of life. She was on her own by age 16, and by 19 was married with a baby. But when that marriage ended, she spent the next nine years bouncing from man to man. By the time she was 26, she had three children, all with different fathers, and was looking for someone to take care of her. Then in 1997, in walks Bruce Miller, who Cherie met while she accepted a job at the salvage yard he owned just outside of Flint, Michigan. Bruce also worked at General Motors as an auto worker and ran the salvage yard as a side business. The job was a good fit for Cherie. She was a little rough around the edges and fit in with the yard's rough customers. While Bruce slept in from working the late shift at GM, she opened the business in the mornings. Cherie had finally found the sugar daddy she had been looking for. Bruce, who at 47, was 21 years older than her. They married not long after in April 1999. Their wedding photos, courtesy of NBC's Dateline, show Cherie in a white dress, holding a rose, lovingly looking up at her husband, and Bruce with a matching red rose on the lapel of his dark suit. In another photo, Bruce and Cherie were smiling as they looked into each other's eyes. As reported by Oxygen TV, Cherie was a salesperson for Mary Kay Cosmetics and traveled the country selling products to her clients. To help her keep track of her customer accounts, Bruce bought her a computer. It was while she was researching vacations on the internet that she discovered adult chat rooms, and soon she was habitually logging on and sharing her deepest sexual fantasies with complete strangers. She met many men in the chat rooms, but one stood out, a man named Jerry Cassidy. Jerry was a former Cass County, Missouri Sheriff's deputy for almost 10 years who had aspirations of becoming an FBI agent. He reached the rank of lieutenant, but his plans were changed when he blew the whistle on things that were happening in his department. Instead of being hailed a hero, Jerry was demoted and pushed out of the force and resigned in 1994. With his career gone and his marriage crumbling, he sank into the depths of despair with alcohol and drugs. Jerry ended up taking a job at a casino in North Kansas City, which then led to a job in Reno, Nevada, where he worked as a pit boss. He had a new job, was in a new city, he was starting his life over. Then he met Sheree Miller and fell hard for her. Cherie had found a second sugar daddy, although it wasn't his money she was after. Jerry was 10 years older than her, but still much younger than her husband. They chatted online frequently and devised a way to finally meet in person. Cherie traveled for her Mary Kay business, and under that premise made the trip to Reno to meet Cherry. She led him to believe that she was a rich businesswoman, and he had no reason to doubt her. She stayed in luxurious hotel suites and told them about Bruce's salvage business, bank account, stocks, and their house. Now you think a cop of all people would have seen through Cherie, but perhaps he was blinded by the fact that someone so young and vivacious was interested in him after his divorce, or perhaps his judgment was impaired by the alcohol and drugs. Either way, he was an easy target for Cherie. She trapped him like unsuspecting prey, she wound him up tight in her block widow's web of lies. Then she pulled him in even deeper, telling him that Bruce was repeatedly beating and sexually abusing her. She claimed that he was a member of the mafia and would never let her go. Now back in Flint, life carried on as normal for Bruce. 
He was happy in his new marriage with Cherie and was planning on adopting her three children. He had no clue of Cherie's darker side. After that rendezvous in Reno, Cherie and Jerry continued their long-distance relationship over the internet. They spent hours sharing hundreds of emails and she even sent him sexy videos. An NBC Dateline episode called Instant Message Murder reports that they had cute screen names for each other. She was Jerry's fool and he was Sherry's fool. Jerry had no idea, but that name would turn out to be 100% correct. Sherry was a master at manipulating men to get what she wanted. In September 1999, she told Jerry she was pregnant with his baby. Then she delivered the news that she lost that baby because Bruce had raped her. Jerry was devastated. His sorrow only fueled her lies, and a month later she told him she was pregnant again, this time with twins, and she patted her belly to make him believe. Meanwhile, Jerry had moved back to Missouri to be closer to family, and when he got the news, he was ecstatic and told her how much he loved her. She emailed him photos of the sonograms, and he loved them. Then on November 5th, Sherry ramped up her plan. She created an email account with her husband's name and emailed Jerry taunting messages. A long email to Jerry told him, Sherry is growing fat with two bastards in her, and she's decided she doesn't like the excess weight and is going to get an abortion. Jerry was panicking. He called the hospital and Flint looking for Cherie. No luck. He then tried her cell phone. No luck. He frantically sent her an email, and later the same day, she wrote back saying she was going away for a few days and would contact him in the next week. On November 7th, Sherry again pretended to be her husband and sent Jerry another tormenting email. The abortion went fine. She felt better knowing she wasn't having any more kids. Thank you for making my relationship with my wife better. What Sherry didn't know was that it was impossible for Sherry to get pregnant by any man. She'd had a tubal litigation in 1995. Then later when Sherry checked his email, he found photos of Sherry badly beaten, presumably by Bruce. Their plan to eliminate him was kicked into overdrive. The email and instant messages were flying back and forth between Sheree and Jerry. NBC reported that Sheree told Jerry, If this don't work, he will hurt me bad. To which Sherry replied, It'll work. Sherry gave him directions to the salvage yard and said she would call Bruce at 5 p.m. She asked if the gun would be loud and Sherry replied, Somewhat. Sherry commented that he wanted Bruce to know who he was. Then Sherry asked him, Are you going to be able to live with this the rest of your life? Because I can. The next day, on November 8th, Jerry traveled from Missouri to Michigan with the 12 gauge shotgun and met Shereen. She gave him her cell phone and told him how much cash Bruce would have on him in his shirt pocket and to make it look like a robbery. That afternoon, Bruce was working alone in his salvage business. As planned, Cherie placed a call from her home to Bruce precisely at 5 p.m. and kept him on the phone while Jerry walked in. The shotgun blast tore into his neck and upper chest. Police estimate that around 6.30 p.m., Bruce Miller was shot dead. At 6.47 p.m., records show Cherie's cell phone calling her home number. The phone rang only once, and the caller hung up. Bruce and Cherie had been married only seven months. Cherie, with her heart of stone, called Bruce's brother Chuck to say she was worried. He wasn't home from the salvage yard and asked him to check on him. Chuck and his wife, Judy, drove to the salvage yard and found Bruce dead on the floor laying on his side in a pool of blood. Police heard Bruce was known to carry a large amount of cash on him used for the salvage business, and when the cash was missing, they thought it was a robbery gone bad. There was also an investigation into an employee tampering with vehicle identification numbers at the salvage yard, and police suspected him of Bruce's murder, but only for a short time, and he was ruled out. Meanwhile, police didn't consider Cherie a suspect at all. Witnesses reported that when Cherie found out Bruce had been killed, she was crying and screaming, but it didn't take long for her to stop playing the part of grieving widow and get back into the swing of things. Two days later, she was reportedly at a bar dancing provocatively. A month later, she moved her boyfriend into their home. But it's not who you think. Cherie was done with Jerry. She had a new boyfriend, a delivery man named Jeff Foster. With Bruce eliminated, Sherry didn't have any use for Jerry and was quickly moving on. In the weeks after the murder, Jerry was hearing less and less from her and didn't understand why. 
After all, he had killed for Cherie so they could be together. But instead, she was flaunting her new boyfriend, and by December, she'd completely broken up with Jerry. A report by the Detroit Free Press stated, Jerry Cassidy sat in his recliner and looked out on the lake behind his apartment in Odessa, Missouri. Nearby were reminders of his life, a photo of his three boys, a photo of his ex-wife, and a photo of his girlfriend. Not far away was his 22 caliber rifle. It had all gone so wrong, and he had been such a fool. Cassidy, an ex-cop, had murdered a man in Michigan for the woman he loved. Now he believed she had lied to him. One day in February, Cassidy decided he would not go to prison, because ex-cops can't go to prison. But Jerry Cassidy wouldn't take secrets to the grave. The report goes on to say that Jerry Cassidy had made a few final preparations. His suicide notes were ready. He tells his parents that she just wanted all her money and no more husband. I know it was all just more lies and games from Cherie. She didn't care what it took or who she hurt to get what she wanted. He opened a Bible in his lap. He picked up the twenty two caliber rifle and leaned the stock against his left knee. He put the muzzle in his mouth and pulled the trigger. Whether it was the guilt of killing an innocent man or being spurned by the woman he killed for, Jerry took his own life. On February 11, 2000, he was found by a family member. His body slumped in the recliner, the gun still in his hand resting on the Bible in his lap. Further on, it's reported by his brother John Cassidy that Jerry had told him to look for a briefcase if something happened to him and follow the directions. After the suicide, John said he found that briefcase, which had three letters, one addressed to Jerry's parents, one to his ex-wife, and another to his son. Attached to the briefcase was a note saying it should be opened in the presence of an attorney. All three letters were opened after Jerry's funeral. And Jerry would seek revenge from the grave. He would turn out to be just as conniving as Cherie. He had documented their instant messages plotting to murder Bruce, including Cherie's driving directions to the salvage yard. In a suicide confession, he wrote, I drove there and killed them. Sherry was involved and helped set it up. Jerry's family contacted a lawyer who turned over the evidence to the Genesee County Sheriff's Department. The police would act swiftly on the evidence, and 11 days later, on February 22nd, they arrested Cherie as she and her new boyfriend, Jeff, were stepping off a plane returning from a vacation in Reno. She was charged with second-degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder. As reported by the Grand Rapids Legal News, a trial her defense lawyer would argue that Jerry could have made up the instant messages and portrayed Jerry as a gullible, suicidal, drug-addicted, and then a loser who set up Cherie to avenge being jilted. And Cherie testified that she did have an affair with Jerry and admitted to the emails and sending him in a sonogram. She also admitted to sending him a videotape showing the junkyard and her children and telling Jerry that one day it would all be his. But she denied plotting to kill Bruce and said that her online affair with Jerry was just fantasy and nothing more. The trial was relatively quick, and on January 29, 2001, Sherry was found guilty for conspiracy to murder and sentenced to life in prison. In addition, she was found guilty of second-degree murder and sentenced to 54 to 81 years. Her children went to live with their mother. Sherry would spend the rest of her life in prison. Or so you would think. As outlined in court documents, Cherie appealed her conviction, and in a twist of fate, the federal court ruled in August 2008 that because Jerry was dead and could not be cross-examined, his suicide note should not have been admitted into court, and therefore Cherie would get a new trial. Almost a year later, on July 16, 2009, a federal judge ordered Cherie released from prison pending her new trial. But don't lose faith. The very next day, a Genesee County prosecutor ordered Cherie be rearrested and charged her again with second-degree murder and conspiracy to commit premeditated first-degree murder. She was released on a $100,000 bond until her new trial began. On July 29, 2009, after eight and a half years in prison, Cherie was free. Eleven months later, in June 2010, a three-judge panel ruled that Cherie's suicide note was not admissible. Another 18 months would go by before U.S. Supreme Court remanded Shuri's case to the Court of Appeals in November 2011. Eight and a half months later, on August 2012, the District Court reinstated Shuri's convictions for secondary murder and conspiracy to commit murder. Her bond was revoked, 
and she returned to prison to continue serving her sentence. Cherie had enjoyed three years on the outside with her family. Meanwhile, Bruce's family had missed out on the last 12 and a half years with him since his murder. Now you think the story would end here, but with Cherie, there's always another twist. Four years after Cherie went back to prison at the Women's Huron Valley Correctional Facility in Michigan, she sent a letter to Judge Judith Fullerton. She's the judge who originally sentenced Sherry to prison. Remember when Sherry asked Jerry, are you going to be able to live with this the rest of your life? Because I can? Well, apparently she couldn't. In her letter to the judge, Sherry confessed to Bruce's murder. On Michigan Live, you can read Sherry's full confessions. It's four pages, neatly typed. She starts by addressing the judge and saying that for many years I blamed you for my coming to prison. It was easier that way, or so I thought. I want to tell the truth now. She goes on to say that the turning point for her was when she returned to prison in 2012. Her daughter dropped her off and was crying hard and screaming, No, Mom, no, don't leave. That's when Sherry said she realized the full impact of what I had done to Bruce, his friends and family. Jerry and his friends and family it hit me full force. They will never get to see them again. My daughter will be able to come see me. Bruce's children will never get to hug their dad again. I will still be able to feel my children's arms around me. Bruce's brother will never be able to sit down and have a conversation with him again. But my brothers can still come to see me. I manipulated a man into killing another man. Shireen goes on to say that when she went to the parole board and was asked if she had time to stop the murder, she answered yes, she has 16 and a half hours, and didn't. She knew it was going to happen and allowed it. She claimed that the last 16 years she'd asked three different attorneys to let her tell the truth, and they said no. She says, I don't deserve freedom. When I think of the 16 hours waiting until Bruce was in the right place and the right time to end his life, and she continues on with, I don't want Bruce's or Jerry's family to have to suffer anymore. They have waited 16 years to hear me say I am guilty. I did it. About Bruce, she said, he gave me anything I ever wanted, I didn't have to work for anything. His love was free. She even thanks Judy Fullerton, saying, You saved my children from a horrible mother. They had a great life once I came here. My mother made sure they were all well taken care of, so my coming to prison saved their lives. Near the end of the confession, she admits, I hurt a lot of people. I destroyed a lot of lives. It's time to end the lies and tell the truth. And she tells Judge Fullerton, Thank you for not letting me in any way get away with murder. Sherry is where she deserves to be, in prison for the rest of her life at the Michigan Department of Corrections. She is inmate number 326122. Thanks for listening to Murder in 20 with less talk and more true crime. Be sure to tune in next Wednesday for the episode of 13-year-old Erica Parsons who quietly disappeared in 2011 and no one noticed. That is, until two years later, when her brother reported her murder to police. A tragic story emerged to betrayal by those who were supposed to protect her. I'd like to acknowledge Purple Planet for use of their music and our many editorial sources who are listed on our website. If you're dying to hear more, past episodes of Murder in 20 are available for free at murderin20.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and YouTube. And every week we announce upcoming episodes on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Until then, stay safe, sleep with the lights on, and don't play with strangers. <laughs>